Hello! <laughs> Welcome to the stream. Uh, as you can see, I don't have the Torgerson Bridge behind me today. Um, instead, I have a black void, which is less of a void because it's a curtain. Um, <clears throat> and that is because I am not in the space that I have been using since January. I am in uh, the Data Visualization Studio instead of the Media Design Space. Um, I don't know how long I'll be here. I may end up downstairs in my office for a few of these. We'll see. Uh, <laughs> the setup is different, but we are here to explore some archives on archival adventures. I'm Anthony Wright Day Hernandez, your host, the Community Collections Archivist here at Virginia Tech in Special Collections and University Archives. I do have um, just a couple acknowledgments to do before we dive into the content. Um, these are the newly updated um, uh, land and uh, labor acknowledgments that um, Virginia Tech has come out with, and so I do think it is important to read them. Um, but uh, I know them less well than I did the previous ones because these have been newly updated. So uh, Virginia Tech acknowledges that we live and work on the Tutelo Monacan people's homeland, and we recognize their continued relationships with their lands and waterways. We further acknowledge that legislation and practices like the Morrill Act of 1862 enabled the Commonwealth of Virginia to finance and found Virginia Tech through the forced removal of native nations from their lands, both locally and in Western territories. We understand that honoring native peoples without explicit material commitments falls short of our institutional responsibilities. Those, through sustained, transparent, and meaningful engagement with the Tutelo and Monacan peoples and other native nations, we commit to changing the trajectory of Virginia Tech's history by increasing indigenous student, staff, and faculty recruitment and retention, diversifying course offerings, and meeting the growing needs of all Virginia tribes and supporting their sovereignty. We must also recognize that enslaved black people generated revenue and resources used to establish Virginia Tech and were prohibited from attending until 1953. Through Inclusive VT, the institutional and individual commitment to ut prosim that I may serve, in the spirit of community, diversity, and excellence, we commit to advancing a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive community. So that is the new um, land and labor acknowledgments that Virginia Tech is currently using. Um, there is language in there saying that we're going to actually take concrete steps. So I hope that the institution lives up to those commitments that are recognized by that. Um, my work specifically uh, is to work with um, historically neglected, historically ignored, historically oppressed, and historically marginalized, many, many different ways of describing it, uh, communities to ensure that their stories are part of the historical record. Um, so that is a lot of the work that I do in archives. Um, that said, <laughs> we won't necessarily be looking at those collections today. Today, um, I did have a request from a viewer a couple weeks ago to show off some various different kinds of handwriting. So we're looking at handwritten documents. I've pulled a variety of them. Um, I don't have a huge time range. Uh, a lot of this stuff is coming from the Civil War era because that's where we have a lot of material. But I'm happy to show off handwritten documents. And you can all have fun watching me try to read them. Uh, <laughs> so um, hopefully that will be enjoyable for you. Uh, hello, Hannah. Welcome in. And thank you for joining. Um, so I have a cart full of stuff to uh, show off on stream. Um, some of it will probably be easy to read, and some of it's going to be pretty difficult for me to make out. Um, I'm not sure where to start. I'm just going to grab something. This is less organized than most other weeks. <laughs> so what I'm pulling right now, I have box one of the John Henning Woods papers. Um, oh, yes. This, this will be interesting. This has some shorthand in it. Um, but I should probably start by reading you the uh, finding aid so that we can learn a little bit about these papers. Um, let me go ahead and pull that up. Also, I do believe that I have switched us off of emote only, uh, <laughs> unlike last week. Uh, 
Oh boy, okay, let me get this here and... think all right all right all right oh and we have a raid coming in from 16-bit eric welcome whimsies to uh archival adventures um I'm uh, Anthony Wright de Hernandez, Community Collections Archivist here at Virginia Tech. You know me as uh, Rogan27 if you're coming in with 16-bit um, Eric's community. Eric, thank you so, so much for um, rating the channel regularly during this program. It is very much appreciated and noticed. Um, we do not have a green screen in this space, Lord Portico. I am in a different room. Um, the Media Design Studio has our sound mixing and um, like sound and video editing equipment um, and is needed for uh, students to use. Um, this space was our uh, data visualization studio and wasn't heavily used. Um, and so currently I'm in here with a completely different setup. Uh, we put the streaming rig on a cart and it is here. Next week uh, I may be here or I may be downstairs in my office. I don't know yet. Um, Eventually a permanent home will be found and I will work very hard to get a green screen there. Uh, yes, there are other rooms. <laughs> uh, but anyway, welcome in uh, Raiders, uh, Relfexive, uh, DJ Phoenix, Adventures of Tony, Lord Portico. Welcome, it's good to see you all. Um, this program is Archival Adventures where I share materials from the Virginia Tech um, Special Collections and University Archives. It's the name of the department I work in, and my brain just blanked out on it. Um, so uh, three weeks ago, I think it was, uh, I had a viewer who was interested in seeing handwritten materials. Um, and so I have pulled a variety of handwritten materials from our collections. And we're just going to take a look at those today, kind of to look at the stylistic types of handwriting. I don't know a lot about different kinds of handwriting, but we'll get to see some. Um, and you all get to have fun watching me try to make out what things say. I will pick passages in the materials and try to read them to you. And that should be lots of fun, I hope. <laughs> um, DJ Phoenix, in fact, there are three lights in this room, but I get the reference and I appreciate it very much. I have three LED lights that are dazzling my eyes as I, I look at this. Actually, the lighting in here, I think for stream is actually better than in the other room, or at least we have, I'm not relying mainly on overheads in here, which is what I was doing there. Um, but also, hello, Tumor Boy. Um, so I was just getting out the John Henning Woods uh, papers, box one, and I was going to read a little bit about John Henning Woods, and then we're going to take a look at these things. Um, but because my face on a black screen isn't the nicest thing to look at forever, uh, <laughs> I'm going to drop down uh, some stuff on the document cam. We'll switch over there, and then I will read to you about uh, who John Henning Woods is, and we'll take a look at some of the handwriting in his stuff, um, which, if I can find the page, there's some lovely Pittman shorthand that I absolutely will not be able to read, but we can see what it looks like. Uh, <laughs> a joke about Portico's comment? Yes. Have to get the Star Trek references in there. Um, okay, so John Henning Woods. Uh, let's see. In this collection, it's a one box collection. Uh, you can see the box here. Um, it includes three memoir volumes and three diaries written by John Henning Woods, a Southern Unionist Confederate conscript and eventual Union soldier during the American Civil War. While the collection spans the period of years from 1856 through 1873, the majority of the collection focuses on the years during the Civil War. So a little biographical note here. Uh, John Henning Woods, a Southern Unionist Confederate conscript and Civil War memoriast, was born in Tennessee on July 4th, 1834. Uh, gives 
a little bit about who he married, um, where he moved. Despite his ties to the South, Woods hated slavery and strongly supported the Union. Following the war's beginning and interruption of his education, he returned home to farm and teach. Due to his support for the Union, Woods chose to remain at home throughout the beginning of the war until his conscription into the Confederate Army in October of 1862. While at first Woods fought to remain at home, the threat of imprisonment eventually sparked him to report to the Army, where he was drafted into the 36th Alabama Infantry Regiment, Company K, and as part of this regiment, Woods was trained at Talladega and then posted around Mobile, Alabama. While at Mobile, Woods and a few fellow Unionist conscripts formed a secret Unionist organization called the Home Circle and planned a mutiny. Unfortunately, Woods was discovered prior to their planned mutiny and imprisoned to be tried. While awaiting his court-martial, Woods was transported behind the army, following them through the Tullahoma campaign, and was then sent to Atlanta. His trial resulted in a sentence of death by firing squad. However, his execution was delayed due to the interference of a sympathetic general who had been his professor before the war. Woods saw the battles of Chickamauga and Chattanooga while imprisoned by the Confederate Army until he was once again sent to Atlanta following a stay of ex execution, uh, furnished at the last minute from Jefferson Davis. He was then sent to work building trenches around Atlanta until he finally escaped Confederate officials on August 11, 1864, and made his way into Union lines. Following his escape, he made his way to Buffalo, New York, where he enlisted in the 93rd New York Infantry Regiment. He served out the rest of the war as a clerk for the Union Army until his discharge on May 11, 1865. Following the war, Woods returned home and continued to teach, moving to Lawrence County, Mississippi sometime during, or before 1885. Wow. So that is a bit of a story. Hi, Fluid Ann. Um, and hello, Scraff. <laughs> yes, it is today. Um, and today I pulled a bunch of uh, handwritten documents for you to look at. Um, I don't have a huge variety, but I pulled kind of the most interesting ones that we have, and uh, there should be a couple of different varieties of handwriting in them. Um, so this, this was your request, if I remember correctly, Scraff, to, to see handwritten stuff. So <laughs> the first stuff I have is John Henning Wood's Civil War era, um, so 1860s, and uh, these are going to be diaries, uh, longhand um, journals and diaries that he wrote during the Civil War. Um, this one is lacking its cover, but on the front page there you can see written, it says, Woods, Woods's defense or the Union man's plea before a secession court by John Henning Woods Mount Vernon, Missouri. So I'm not going to like read a ton from this one, but look, uh, <clears throat> this appears to be a book that he prepared to put together his defense, uh, obviously, given the title. Um, but look at the this, it has a preface. Who puts a preface in a private journal? Um, but, you know, of course, this was prepared for his defense. Uh, this work is original, true, and purely American, uh, and makes no other claim to merit. I have undertaken the production uh, reluctantly after many solicitations of friends Uh, hoping to propagate some truths not published here, heretofore. <laughs> well, it's not just that it's in cursive. Um, hang on, I'm going to try and move the camera, the document camera, a little closer to me so that I can actually um, read these things a little bit easier. Uh, it was on the other side of the table, and I'm like, 
I can't see that. My old eyes just can't make it out. Um, anyway. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, and that it may encourage firmness in the right, add to the useful lessons of the way, uh, confirm in the ways of independence, virtue, and patience. So, yeah, it, it's cursive, but this is, um, this is actually almost vertical compared to a lot of Civil War era cursive. Um, we'll probably see some others that have a, a much more pronounced slant. And uh, if you look at like modern cursive, a lot of the slant, the bottom of the letter is to the right of the top of the letter. Um, Civil War era, the top of the letter is to the right of the bottom of the letter and quite often really far to the right. So it'll be like laying down at like 45 degrees um, so th this, this is actually fairly easy to read. Um, but the one that I want to show from this collection, uh, since I have lots of stuff to look at, um, and, and the John Henning Woods stuff is actually available. You can see the journals on our, um, on our website, uh, <laughs> Hi, wannabe. Uh, so here, in the middle of this journal, we have a mixture of writing. Uh, I'm going to try and zoom in a little bit here. So you get the the just regular long longhand script um, with the slant to the right, um, but then here the slant disappears, and I don't know why that is. I I just I don't know. It's like the difference between standard letters and italics, except that the italics are straight up and down instead of slanted. And I don't know why that is. So if anybody knows a lot about handwriting, I would love to have you inform me of that. Um, yeah, uh, Phoenix, I, it does seem like that first journal was um, just an account of the court case that he was in. Um, so I'm going to try and read some of this. Let's see. Uh, thoughts, thoughts like these and similar ones uh, caused my mind to work and by such reflections in regard to the dubious future, the unalloyed quietude of farmer years began to make its exit from my footsteps. And now at that stage of my life, I find myself in uh, commotion intellectually. But what can I do? Uh, pecuniary considerations forbid any great advantages and a deficit of natural talent seemed to forbid an attempt at anything high. And it does seem that that, so where he switches styles there, it does seem like that is meant to emphasize. So essentially, those straight up and down letters are italics, um, which is just fascinating to me. Uh, I find myself too soon after the years of puberty have passed come a willing a willing it looks like v-i-o-t-s-i-n which is not a word that I am familiar with so I'm probably not reading it correctly. Uh, 
to the passions, a willing, ah, victim. A willing victim to the passions and then sunshine and night darkness was my experience. Uh, I can't quite make out that word. Um, as I received approval or dis in, disappointment. But then he goes into Pittman shorthand. And, oh, it's not code. It's, it's an actual style of shorthand. Uh, I can see if I can get a link to some information about it. Um, So I, I definitely will not be able to read this portion. Uh, let me drop this link in here, and then I will drop it in over here. <laughs> this, is, this is why I pulled this book out. Uh, so this is just going to be the Wikipedia link. Wikipedia is great for um, initial primers on topics if you need like hard hard reference material for research or things like that. Wikipedia is not great, but it's a great starting point and you can find actual reliable sources uh, because Wikipedia requires um, that information be linked out to other sources. Um, so if you want a good primer on Pittman shorthand, uh, that is there. I'm also going to drop in a link to the journals on our site. Uh, one second. I'm not sure. <laughs> not sure where my mods are right now. They haven't uh, been in like commenting in chat, so I'm not sure if they're here at the moment uh, and able to do these for me. So I'm just going to grab it myself and drop it in. Uh, so if you want to study the journals more in depth, um, that is the link. Let me drop it here as well. <laughs> One second as I grab this. Uh, this is the problem with two computers uh, streaming to two different channels. Um, I have to do double the stuff if I want to actually share things. Uh, okay, let me grab this link, drop it in the chat. Uh, so let me read what this, uh, just a short description of Pittman shorthand here, because uh, that is the, the type of script that covers most of these two pages. It's a system of shorthand for the English language uh, developed by Englishman Sir Isaac Pittman, 1813 to 1897, who first presented it in 1837. Like most systems of shorthand, it is a phonetic system. The symbols do not represent letters, but rather sounds. And words are, for the most part, written as they are spoken. Uh, in the 19th century, what we, in 2021, would call shorthand was referred to as phonography. Uh, it was first used by newspaper reporters, and newspapers sent phonographers to cover important speeches, usually stating as a claim of accuracy that they had done so. I don't understand that sentence, but okay. Uh, the practice got national attention in 1858 during the Lincoln-Douglas debates taken down phonographically. The shorthand was converted into words during the trip back to Chicago where typesetters and tele telegraphers awaited them. Uh, in 1996, Pittman shorthand was the most popular shorthand system used in the United Kingdom and the second most popular in the United States. Interesting. Let me see. I will attempt to read this. I don't know that I will be able to read any of it um, because I have never tried to read Pittman shorthand. 
ooh, there's the websites that say like level one introduction. Oh, that doesn't bode well for me being able to do this on stream now, does it? Um, let's see what the logograms look like. Common words are represented by special outlines called logograms or short forms. Consonants. B, P, D, T, J, Ch, G, K, V. Okay, that all makes sense. Vowels. Yeah, this is a whole thing where you would need to actually learn how it is done. At the moment, all I know in looking at this document and looking at the information available on Wikipedia about Pittman shorthand is this slash here uh, sounds like either B or P. <laughs> Same with that one. Uh, I'm sure with a couple of hours, I could probably figure it out. Um, and actually, that sounds like a t hugely fun thing to do. Um, so I may have to revisit this sometime after I've learned to read Pittman shorthand so that I can read this section to you all. Um, but today's focus is handwriting, and I thought it was interesting. Um, I thought it would be interesting to share this uh, this journal goes from just long form cursive to an italic version of long form cursive where the slant disappears and then into Pittman shorthand. Um, and I just thought that that was a really interesting kind of juxtaposition all within the same journal. Uh, it returns to the long form cursive. There's more in the straight perpendicular cursive. I don't know if it's technically italics. I don't know what it's called. Um, but he's shifting back and forth between these different styles of writing in this journal. And to me, I think that's really, really interesting. Um, and as I said, these are all online. That second link that I shared, the one to digitalsc.lib.vt.edu, um, will take you to the collection. These have all been scanned, and so you're free to examine them on our website. Um, if you want to see more of them. But I'm going to move from that and actually start looking at some of the other items that I pulled, because I have way more than we will ever see today. Um, when do I bring less than we're going to see in a day? Um, do I have official letters? Um, I have letters. I don't know about official letters. Anything with slant. So uh, I, I have a couple things to share. Let me see. which ones I wanted to pull from here. So I have another unique kind of um, example, if I can find it real quick. And then I will absolutely dive into do, do, do. Oh, I'm going backwards in the box from the direction that I wanted to go. That would be why I wasn't finding what I was hoping to find. One moment. I know it's it's not. Ah, here's the folder I wanted. <laughs> so an another kind of unique thing that we have multiple examples of in our collection that I wanted to share. Um, this is from the William Avery Stratton correspondence. Um, there are lots of these letters. Uh, these. 
the correspondence that we have is dated 1864 to 1940, so covering a large period of time. But what I wanted to show, the reason I grabbed this collection, and honestly, this is a mild example, but it's the one that I've been able to find, um, is this cross-hatching. We have numerous examples. This collection has tons of it, um, but it gets pulled for various reasons because people want to see it because it's unique and interesting and they don't understand it. Um, so this is a letter from this collection dated January 17th, 1870. And as you can see, this front page of this letter has writing that is going left to right on the lines, because this is lined paper. Uh, but if you turn it 90 degrees, it also has writing going this direction on the paper. And so we have numerous examples of this. And essentially, what is going on here and why it is this way is um, during the Civil War time period, it was often difficult. Uh, especially for soldiers who were out in the field to get a hold of paper. So you get really strangely shaped pieces of paper for the letters, but you also get people who didn't weren't done writing their letter and ran out of space. And so they would turn it sideways and continue writing. Um, and we even have a couple, I would have to spend time to find them because I haven't looked for them myself in the past and I didn't have time to go search them out. But we have some where they start in this orientation and then they turn it 90 degrees and keep going and they're still not done. So they turn it 90 degrees again and write upside down in the spaces between the original lines. And the thing is, I have no idea how they ever expected anyone to be able to read the letters when they were received because it all just becomes really jumbled together. And you have to remember, like, I've got it here where I've got computers. I can magnify it with uh, camera zoom. I can um, put different lighting on it. I can put really bright lights on it. I can light it from behind. I can do. They had candles and lanterns to try and read this by. Oh, um, DJ Phoenix, they would totally flip the paper over. They would cover both sides of the paper. Um, this one is, is a mild example where only the front has the sideways writing. Um, and so this letter, if you read it, um, let's see. When your kind and uh, I don't know what word that is. I, d I don't know. Uh, when your kind and something letter arrived, I was away on a visit to my uncle and therefore did not receive it until the last of the week. I was very much surprised to hear that you were away down in New Jersey, but also very much pleased to hear that you are enjoying yourself so well. Uh, you would You would, I think it says doubtedly, uh, but I, I don't think that's right. Y you would something like to know how I am getting along. So doubtless, possibly doubtless, yes. It is doubtless, but with the um, double S being what we would looking at it today, think was an F. <clears throat> um, so that continues 
Let's see. Uh, you would doubtless like to know how I am getting along. This one is also relatively unique for the time period because when you flip the page, it continues here, uh, getting along with my school. Typically, <laughs> your nose is about three inches from your monitor. I mean, I, I kept getting closer to it myself. But um, typically with letters from this time period, I'm just going to zoom out a little bit to make this point. Um, it would start here and continue down. You would reach the end of the page. You turn, and it would continue here. And when you reach the end of this page, the third page would be here. And when you reach the end there, then it would move to the back. So the fact that this one actually starts page one and page two on the left side here is unusual. Um, but so the letter starts on the front, fills up the middle, fills up the back. They've run out of space. They return to the front and turn it sideways and keep going. And they run out of space there. So they actually continue onto the inside again, uh, writing in the margin. Um, but the, this is very common, actually, for, for the time period for them to write sideways across it. Um, and it is possible to read. So here, this is. Uh, to remember in kindness your lonely friend, Allie. Um, I saw your brother, Harvey, and Mrs. George Stratton in town last week, but not to speak to them. They were looking well. Please remember that I shall uh, expect that visit from you and Aunt Savina when you return. I think it says Savina. I'm, I could be, it, it's S-O-V-I something A. Um, I read it as an N, but I'm not sure. <clears throat> Let me know if you can before you come, and I will promise to be at home. Sorry you could not have brought her up here before you went away. So it, it's definitely possible to read. It is definitely not as easy as... Um, so if, if you came across a letter like this on like a TV show, like a police procedural CSI type TV show, they'd be like, oh, well, light it up in different lights and, you know, the the different lines of text will fluoresce at different colors. and you This was all written with the same pen and the same ink. So that isn't going to do anything. Um, <clears throat> if you really wanted to pick them apart and see the different handwritings, um, I, I actually had uh, my husband suggested to me, because I was chatting with him about this document, uh, this type of document, was that um, you could use a computer and like zoom in and use like photo editing processes to cut out the parts that were not part of the word forms that you were trying to see. And you could eventually, doing that, pick apart each direction and have them as their own documents. But that would be a lot of really painstaking work. Um, and when you start to get to the point where they've written in all four directions and started across in a fifth direction, a, your brain just can't make out one letter form from another at that point, and B, that's a lot of staffing hours to try and pick it apart digitally. But you could do it. Um, but anyway, I just I that was another kind of unique writing that I wanted to show. Fancy and stupid. <laughs> um, documentaries that I can recommend about. This, so I'm not an expert in this. I just know that I knew that these existed, and um, I've I'm familiar with them because they're part of our collections. But I have never really dug deeply into the research on this type of 
um, cross hatching in the writing. Um, I don't know if Kira is around and might have something that she could recommend. Um, I will say that into the ether, hoping that she will respond. Uh, but otherwise, I would I would just recommend searching for um, like Civil War crosshatched letters or something like that, and you may find something that somebody's put together. Um, because I do know that it was definitely a thing, and this is not the only person uh, to have done that. Um. <laughs> it, it is a very difficult letter to read. <laughs> All right, let's see what I have now for other... Well, <laughs> I, I would love to learn it from a professional, too, because <laughs> um, I am definitely not an expert on all of the things that I share on this stream. Uh, let's see. What do I have? What do I have? All right. I have a couple folders here. I'm going to pull them out. We're going to take a look and see what I've got. Um, this is from the Anne Hume Diary, or it is called the Anne Hume Diary. So let me see what I have here. It looks like 1830s. <clears throat> I have a lot of diaries today. The Diary of Anne Hume, who who I'm not sure something Samuel Woolman mother of uh, I feel like it's married Samuel Woolman but I, I can check the finding aid and we'll see uh, mother of Hannah B. Woolman, uh, 1840. Memorandum Private, January 1st, Wednesday. Went to church in the morning. The bishop lectured in circumcision. on circumcision. Uh, I was not expecting that topic to show up uh, immediately upon opening a this diary. Uh, so 1840, let me see what I can find out about this person. Diary of Anne Hume, whose entries talk about school and home life, her courtship and marriage, gender relations, and family. The entries, though scattered, range from December 25th, 1836 until June 10th, 1850. Was born in Pennsylvania, married Samuel Woolman, in eight, uh, who was born in 1818, following their marriage. They moved a number of times. They had seven children, including Hannah, Frederick, Howard, Apparently, those are the only names of the children that we're aware of. Huh. I, yes. Uh, this is an accountant book, yes. Um, <laughs> that's actually a really good question, Scraf. Uh, does someone have to be famous to have their manuscripts stored, or does it have to be historically interesting? Um, it depends, which is our favorite answer to everything. <laughs> uh, 
Um, definitely famous people, their, their manuscripts, their papers are of interest and a lot of them end up having their materials saved. But we have a lot of materials from people who we would not consider to be famous in any way. Like this, this diary here from Anne Hulme, um, literally all we know about her is she was born in Pennsylvania on October 30th, 1820. She married Samuel Burr Woolman. Um, they moved a few times and had some kids. Uh, and, and so really this diary is what we have. And the fact that this is a diary that talks about her home life. Um, let's see, it talks about her time in school, visits from relatives, public lectures, church activities, her work feeding silkworms, uh, courtship with her husband. Um, so it's really just everyday life. Uh, and so for us, um, our archives collects material on the American Civil War. And this diary is a, a snapshot of life at home during the Civil War period um, for somebody in kind of the, the Rust Belt area states. Uh, so. There are a number of reasons why somebody might be interested in this. Uh, the time period of it, the fact that it is written by a woman, it, it is giving a perspective, just a description of what everyday life is like during that time period. Um, so many of the documents that end up getting saved from the American Civil War period in particular are from soldiers who were out uh, fighting the war. Um, or you get documents from scholars, you get documents from, um, in archives, you get, you tend to get documents from rich white Christian men. Uh, if you go to basically any archives in existence in the Western Hemisphere, you're going to find primarily manuscripts from rich white Christian men. Um, and so as archives began to try to diversify themselves, uh, part of changing collection development was to think about, well, who's not represented? Who should be part of the historical record here? Whose stuff should we be collecting? So then you start to expand into white Christian women. Uh, and then you start to get people who are interested in collecting material about people of color um, and suddenly start to find that there aren't a lot of papers written by people of color. A lot of that history was stories told to family members, which is when oral history starts to come into archival work as people go and interview people and ask them to relate their family stories because um, marginalized groups weren't able to have access to the education or the materials for writing down and documenting their history in the same way as those rich white people. Um, and so that's when you start to get oral histories uh, and personal accounts with uh, people who are just being interviewed telling about their lives as primary sources that start to show up in archives. Um, so it really depends on the archives, kind of what you're gonna find and whose materials might be there. Um, this document here, I don't know absolutely why it's in our archives. I look at it, I look at the time period it's from, and I, my best guess as to why this was collected is that it is an account from a woman of everyday life during the Civil War period. Um, so I hope that that helps and, and answers that. <laughs> um, I think it would be interesting to know how handwriting was taught. Um, I, like, 
I, I have examples of handwriting here, but handwriting and like education and that, that type of topic is kind of outside the scope of what we collect. Um, that we collect on areas, we collect the American Civil War, we collect history of food and drink, um, history of science and technology, but mainly focused on aerospace engineering and railroad engineering. Um, and now I'm going to blank on the things, uh, history of women and the built environment. So, and that's primarily women architects that we collect. Um, university history for Virginia Tech. And I'm definitely forgetting a collecting area that I shouldn't be forgetting, but um, uh, like in order for us to add something to our archives, we have to connect it to one of those collecting areas in some way for us to be interested in, in adding it to the archives. I don't think we have uh, books that were used to teach handwriting. I know we have um, some things in our collection on um, certain kinds of scripts, um, like different types of alphabets. I, I know we have a couple of things on that. Um, I haven't really examined them too much myself. And we definitely have tons of blueprints. I would love to share the blueprints on stream. Um, the current space that I have and the current setup that I have for sharing documents uh, won't work for that. I need to have a different type of camera setup because blueprints are just too big for the space that I have to work with. Um, eventually, eventually I will be, uh, I will share architects materials and, um, and blueprints on stream. Uh, there's just some technical work that has to go into it before I can actually make that a, a reality. Uh, we do have hand-drawn ones, as well as ones that were done with um, computer-aided drafting uh, software. So l let me pull out another item here. We have the Ann Hulme Diary, Civil War Era, Everyday Snapshot of Life. Um, let's see, Thomas W. Manchester Diary. And this, I'll show you the cover there. I'm going to pull up Manchester and see what I know about it. Uh, and then we'll take a look inside. Thomas Manchester. Let's see. Thomas Wilbur Manchester was born in Providence, Rhode Island in 1841, married on September 1st to uh, September 1st, 1861 to Martha Neth of Glastonbury, Connecticut. They had one child, uh, enlisted as a private and joined Company A of the 1st Rhode Island Infantry. Let's see what this diary is about. Single Civil War diary uh, from 1863, diary starts after 14 months of service in the 1st Rhode Island Infantry. Uh, topics include weather, daily events, including picketing and marches. So I will find an entry and read one of them. Um, so the, the alphabet, like handwriting materials that we have, uh, I don't know. Uh, like, I remember seeing them. I'm not even sure that with a quick search I can find them. One second, let me see what I can find. Um, but they're not going to be materials that we have digitized. Um, Yeah, uh, 
the only one that I can think of off the top of my head that I know the name of. Hang on, let me see what I've got. Yeah. Um, so we have a, an item on our shelves that is a reproduction of um, the Book of Kells. I know there were other things next to it on the shelf, but I don't know how to go about finding them. I would have to like walk down there and take a look. Um, so sadly, I can't can't point you towards those materials very easily um, from the stream where I am right now. Uh, it's just it's not one of the areas that we really collect in. I'm not even sure why we have the the work on the Book of Kells in our collection to begin with. Um, but I can give you the name of the one that I know we have. I just don't know. Um, I don't know what else we have in the collection. Daily Pocket Remembrancer, 1863. Rates of postage. I just want to find a, a written entry in here if I can. <laughs> Lots of empty pages, um, just like modern people who get day planners and don't end up writing them. And so here, another example of cross-hatching. Um, on Tuesday the 14th of April, he had more to say than would fit in this little square and wrote left to right, turned the page and, and wrote perpendicular to that. <laughs> I do really like uh, the the writing from this period is definitely pretty. Um, let's see. I will attempt to read an entry from this diary. Um, I am not going to attempt the cross-hatched one uh, because the initial writing on the cross-hatched entry for this diary is just really, really faint. And I don't think that I will have any luck reading it right now. Let's see. And so you can see this person's handwriting, same time period, the handwriting is very different. It's not as, it, I, I'd say these are more rounded letters. They're not as sharp as the previous uh, handwriting that we had seen. Um, and they don't have as sharp of an angle as the, the John Henning Woods that we looked at. A beautiful day, the regiment started on a march this morning uh, about nine o'clock, Mr. Marsh remained in camp in charge of camp stove uh, in company with the in company with the something. Huh, I don't know what it says. In company with the something are even now on the march. Uh, it's this word right here I can't make out. Um, but the old... Winston Road, about 12 miles from... Warnerton? I that doesn't I don't know that place. Um It's now about <laughs> something o'clock. Uh 12 maybe? Yeah, 12 o'clock. Uh, we have halted to feed, expect to start again soon. This is the watch me attempt to read things on stream portion. Uh, 12 miles from, I think it's, Vanaton? Uh, 
I don't. It looks like uh, twelve miles from W A R N I T O N. It's definitely a W at the beginning, um, but I'm not familiar with that as a place. And actually, that is the same here. Old W A R N I T O N possibly road. Um, it's just, it, it does very much look like a W or like a V, uh, but when you get really close to it, you can see it's got that second loop. It's just um, not as pronounced as the first time that he wrote it. Uh, anyway, <laughs> I have plenty more things to, to show off today, so not going to linger too much on any particular ones. Uh, I have many more diaries and some letters and um, I mean if you do want to see more of a particular one do let me know. Uh, here I have Benjamin M. Peck diaries. Yes, over a hundred years ago. Uh, this one we have we have a diary pencil uh, <laughs> that we've placed inside of some plastic here. Um, so as to not lose it. Uh, let me pull up the description for this one. This is again Civil War era. Um, like I said, we have a lot of Civil War stuff. Um, some, somewhere in here I have stuff that's not Civil War. Uh, let's see, Benjamin Peck. Benjamin M. Peck Diaries. This collection includes two Civil War diaries of Captain Benjamin M. Peck of the 141st Regiment Pennsylvania Inf Infantry and later the 1st U.S. Sharpshooters. Uh, the diaries span 1864 and 1865 and document Peck's experiences traveling from Pennsylvania, his service which took him to major battles in Virginia, and his eventual return home to Tawanda, Pennsylvania. Uh, He enlisted in the Union Army into Company B of the 101st, or 141st Pennsylvania Volunteers Infantry Regiment as a first sergeant. Uh, he was later promoted to second lieutenant, then full captain, wounded in the neck and shoulder by a cannon shot in 1863, returned to his unit after a two-month absence, fully recovered from his injuries, and was mustered out of the service in 1865 in Washington, D.C. So. <laughs> yeah, uh, over 100 years ago, someone was writing their feelings down. All right. I think this is actually the same year that we were just looking at um, in the Thomas Adrian's was it Adrian's? I don't remember who we were just looking at. Uh, April 1865. Um, and again, as you see, they run out of space and they turn it sideways and keep writing. Um, so uh, as I said, that was not an isolated thing. Um, we've had now two in a row of these diaries where it was done. Uh, so that sort of cross-hatched writing, definitely worth investigating if you're interested in it. How did they get the covers? I think, I think these were just bought in a shop. Um, these were personal journals that, that they bought in a shop and they came with these covers. Uh, sort of how you would buy like a journal or something today. Um, wow, we're going to start with me struggling on names. Uh, first thing when I try to read, I'm, I'm trying to read the Friday the 21st of April 1865 entry here. It starts out, uh, Rachel Biltmore at 9 a.m. I hurried as fast as I could to reach the 9 a.m. train 
I got there just in time. All All business was suspended in the city. Again, um, you'll note here in the word business, uh, I can try and zoom in a little bit. But we have that same um, letter formation where at the end of the word, um, the, it has the double S, but it is the the letter form that we would recognize that, or that looks to us in the modern eye like it is the letter F. Um, there is a name for that letter form. Uh, it is called a medial S. or the long S. Um, there is a Wikipedia entry, if you look up long S, uh, an archaic form of the lowercase letter S. It replaced the single S or one or both of the letters S in a double S sequence. So actually, there's a lengthy history of it in the Wikipedia article worth looking at if you're curious about it. Um, but it is still there in use uh, just by general soldiers in 1865 in the American Civil War. Um, all the business was suspended in the city on the account of the uh, presence of the body of President Sinclair no sorry I was that didn't make any sense it looked like Sinclair but it is it is the word Lincoln which makes so much more sense let me tell you the, this did this read to me as Sinclair when I first saw it but it is definitely Lincoln uh, sorry, due to the presence, or on the account of the presence, presence of the body of President Lincoln, uh, which was to lie in state then uh, was to lie in state then during the day. It stormed by pails all day, stopped at possibly Roxbury, I'm not certain on that, for a few moments, uh, went yeah, and it, so the, his handwriting is very short. The letters are very short. You don't get lots of the ups and downs. It's very side to side, um, which is difficult for me to make out. Uh, yeah, the loopy lower part of that L made it really, really difficult. Um, but it is definitely Lincoln. But when we get down to like here, let me see if you can see it. Uh, I, can't, I can't make heads or tails of what that word says. Um, Let's see, uh, when uh, something, the city, I don't know this word either, uh, a vest, but could not find any that suited me.
So I don't know this word and I don't know this word, but basically uh, the gist of the sentence that I'm getting is that he went into town trying to find a vest, but he couldn't find one he liked. Reached. Uh. This is uh, Mick Ilvernus or something like that. I can't make out the entire word. It also, the letters get, you know how if you're writing something and you're running out of space, you'll make the letters smaller and sometimes you start to like turn sideways. That's exactly what he's doing here, which is great. If the people can already read your handwriting, they might be able to make out what you said. In this case, I am absolutely uncertain of, of what he has written here. It does look like M-C-I-L-V, uh, but after that I kind of lose it. And I could be completely off on those letters. I would have to locate other capital M's, um, but his capital M's, his M, like it does appear to be an M. It does look like M C. Um, and then there are two loops, which leads me to think it's I-L, but I'm not certain. Um, I would have to spend some time with that to really hammer out what it's saying. Um, and, and honestly, in reading old documents and trying to make out what they say like this, Proper names of people or places are often the hardest thing to make out. Other words you can get from context clues, you can figure out what it means or what, what they've written in the context of the overall sentence because sentence structure exists and if they're following a regular sentence structure, even if it's not the normal sentence structure, as long as it's consistent within their own usage of structure, it's possible to make out what they're saying and to, to make out what words are um, from context and letter form. When you come across a proper name, you have to start with the letter form and compare it to how they've written letters at other places in their handwriting. And then, uh, if it doesn't make sense, if the if you write out all the letters and it doesn't make sense to you, then you have to start searching to say, okay, what is a place, or, like if it's a place name, start looking at maps to see if there is a place that is spelled similar to that in the region that they're talking about. And sometimes that will point you to what it actually is. Um, but when it's a person's name, sometimes you're just clueless and you have to hope that they wrote it again somewhere else uh, slightly more legibly so that you can make it out. Um, it's actually somewhat fun. Uh, let me see what else I've got in here. Um, it, it's very frustrating and fun at the same time, if that makes sense. Um, let's see, let's see. I've got, uh, oh, this one will be grand fun. Coke, recipe, uh, Coke Receipt, German recipe book. Not dated. Um, so, oh, I, I should zoom out so you can see more than just the pretty blue cover, which is not that blue in real life. Um, the, the stream is apparently giving it a little bit more like of a brighter blue than what I'm seeing in real life. Um, Coke recept. Uh, all right, <laughs> I don't know if we know anything about this. Let's find out. The collection consists of a recipe book handwritten in German. The book is broken up into sections, but only about one-third contain recipes. Most of the recipes are in the uh, back work or baking section. Some examples of recipes include 
uh, kartoffel salat, potato salad, greischklosch, uh, semolina dumplings, and several versions of pfefferkuchen or uh, pfeffernusen, spice cookies. Also, there are two recipes in English and one in German stuck in among the pages. <laughs> so, um, I'm really in for it now. And <laughs> Fluidan, I will, I will accept your help. Um, <laughs> Kartoffel, uh, that's, yeah, potato. Okay, good. We've got at least two people um, who know a little bit of German. Uh, because now, not only am I going to try and read handwriting live on stream, that I have never seen before and am not practiced at reading, I'm going to attempt to read German handwriting. Uh, so not only, not, not that German handwriting is worse, um, just that I had one semester of German in college and it focused on the movie Das Boot and our textbook used the word Zigaretten every other, like every third word. So. I'm definitely not fluent in German. <laughs> um, yeah, I can't read any of this. <laughs> it's the actual German script form from the 1920s based on the Gothic German script, Fraktur. Um, I will attempt to find a page that I can make out, uh, but I included this specifically because we were looking at handwriting styles, and this is a very distinctive handwriting style. Um, it, this is current script. <laughs> um, so this this is definitely something that I pulled specifically for you, uh, uh, Scraff, because um, oh, this is something about cucumbers. Single word in the middle is gherkin, cucumber. I see it, gherkin. Um. <laughs> I wish that I could read this to you. Gefillet or something? Lemon done soft? I, I'm going to turn some pages and see if, I'm just going to see if there's one that pops out as being potentially legible to me, um, rather than making you do all the work. Also, a lot of these pages are empty. Hang on. There was a lot in the uh, back, back work section, according to the description. So let's jump back to the baking section. <gasps> well, now we've got two different styles of handwriting. <laughs> um, I think, I'm just going to guess that this says chocolate. Um, <laughs> but I'm not certain. Um, one half. I'm guessing one half, I, I'm not sure what this is, but this is butter. Uh, hey, biscuit. <laughs> I can make out an occasional word. Um, it's a, a half a pound of butter. <laughs> chocolate is chocolate. Chocolate is weird. <laughs> we made out a single word. Yay, biscuits. <laughs> Eight eigelb egg daughter uh, by the biscuit. I don't know. Also, it, it's clearly been written by two different people. 
because um, we still have this very angular script um, here in the blue ink, but the black ink, um, or sorry, this very slanted uh, sharp script. Here, the letter forms are the same, but it, it doesn't have the same slant to it. It's more up and down um, and a little bit more fluid, less sharp. Um, and a little bit more curved to the letters. So it's definitely a different, um, oh, wow. Uh, you're making good progress here, Scruff. Um, there's uh, vanillin zucker, uh, vanillin sugar, vanilla, uh, vanilla sugar. 400 grams cream. <laughs> This is not the first time that I have brought something in German to show on stream, despite the fact that I cannot read German. Um. <laughs> okay, let me see what else we have. Uh, cakes, ooh, apple. So we definitely have, like it's still this very stylistic, calligraphic, uh, handwriting. Um, here we have apple, apple, a p f a l. Um, I don't know what this second word is though. Near possibly m e r z or n e r z. Oh no, it's an it's the long s again. Uh, Apple Nusskuchen, nut cake. Apple nut cake. Uh, <laughs> it all looks German to me. <laughs> but... <laughs> Um, uh, Scraff, that is an excellent question of, of whether we have a kitchen in the archives. Um, <clears throat> we do not. <laughs> that is not to say that we would not like one. Um, it is definitely something where if we were building a modern archives to suit all of our needs, there would be a test kitchen in that archives. Um, the books themselves would not go in there, but researchers would be able to photograph or, or photocopy uh, recipes from our books and go in and use the kitchen. Uh, we would love to have an event space where we could um, have events uh, where recipes from our books were able to be served at those events. Um, having a history of food and drink collection, we would very much love to have a facility uh, capable of doing that. We sadly do not have the funding or the space to make something like that happen where we are presently located. Um, but it is not outside the realm of possibility for especially a food-based archives to have something like that. Um, in our current setup, if we wanted to host an event focused around uh, tasting or testing uh, recipes from our books, we would have to um, A, have uh, photocopies of the recipes that we wanted to use for actual use near the food. Uh, the books themselves we could show off apart from the foods and liquids because we don't want those getting on the books and damaging them. But there is a test kitchen on campus because we have a food studies program here and um, it would just be a matter of working with them to make an event happen so that we could have um, that industrial f uh, food, uh, food test kitchen available for hosting or doing an event like that. Um, so it's not outside the realm of possibility, it's just a logistical challenge that we would have to deal with. <laughs> Take some old commercial sugar, butter, chocolate. Uh, you made out new words. Eight to ten minutes, twenty-five to thirty minutes. <laughs> yeah, 
Yes, some silica. Like, we would not, um, if we had a kitchen, we would have to keep things very separate. Like, the books themselves, the archival materials would stay in one portion, and they would not be allowed into the area where actual food preparation was happening and food service was happening. Those, um, I have hosted multiple archival events that had archival materials on display and food and like drinks for like, like uh, snacks for people to have at the event. Um, and it's just basically you have to have somebody whose job it is to monitor uh, and make sure that the food and drink does not leave this part of the room and the archival materials stay on the tables over there. So like, I, I literally had student workers that worked at events for me and their job at the event was to monitor the food station and make sure that the food and drink stayed with the food and drink and went nowhere near the materials. <laughs> so it, there are ways to do it. You just have to actually figure it out. So, um, all right, I'm gonna put, move to the next item. Um, let me go ahead and we will see. I have handwritten recipes on Thompson, DeHart and Company letterhead. Um, this one's in plastic. I will, I'm just gonna check and see. Okay, this should be fairly easy for me to take out of the plastic and show you without the glare. Um, unless, how much glare are we getting? Uh, we get some. This is rather fragile. I'm going to try and do it in the plastic. Uh, if I have to move it out, I will. But it, I, I reached in and touched the paper and I'm like, yeah, I probably don't want to take this out of here. It might tear. <clears throat> so we'll, we'll do our best here. This is Thompson DeHart and Company, importers, dealers in hardware, coal, iron, steel, hardwood lumber, and wagon material. Uh, and as you can see, hopefully, let me see if I can reduce the glare there. Um, it's pre-printed uh, with Portland, Oregon, 1880 something. So they were, they were definitely not prepared for too much advancement into the future. This was for use in the 1880s. Um, and what, what do we have here? This is a, a handwritten recipe. Okay. We've got tomato ca tomatoes ketchup and molasses cookies. Tomatoes ketchup on the left here. Uh, one gallon of juice, four tablespoons of salt, one tablespoon black pepper, uh, three tablespoons mustard, three tablespoons cinnamon, two tablespoons cloves, three tablespoons allspice, one teaspoon of cayenne, one quart of vinegar. And that's the entire recipe. No instructions, but it's ketchup. Basically, you mix all those things together and you got ketchup. Uh, all, you probably need to let it like meld a little bit over time though before using it. Molasses cookies, uh, one cup of butter, one cup of, of molasses, one table or one teaspoon of it looks like cloves. I'm not sure. One teaspoon. Oh, teaspoon full cloves. I was like, why does that word, why is that word too long? Uh, one teaspoonful of ginger, sufficient flour to make your dough uh, mold with the hands into small cake and bake in a steamy No. In a steady. Uh, 
rather in a steady rather than quick oven uh, as they are opt to, uh, apt to burn. You've arrived in time for ketchup and molasses cookies. Woo! <laughs> Hi, Kira. <laughs> we were, um, you missed our last thing. I'm going to show it to you and just show you what we were trying to make out a minute ago. Um, we were, we were here just before you got here. Uh, I brought German. I brought handwritten German. Knowing that I would not be able to read it. We have people on both streams, though, that were able to make words out because they can read German. <laughs> it's a great book. I, it's an amazing book. Um, sadly, I don't read German when it's not in stylized handwriting. <laughs> so... Uh, back when you had to specify tomato because ketchup used to refer to any fermented condiment. Technically still can. I've had blueberry ketchup um, at uh, the newsroom in Minneapolis, which is a restaurant that no longer exists. Um, but I had, or I had blueberry ketchup there. Um, and at times uh, in the past in the United States, Walnut ketchup and mushroom ketchup were much more common than tomato ketchup was. Um, I learned that from the, new, from the Food Network. Um, but yeah, mushroom, grape, who needs tomatoes? Uh, I definitely know mushroom and walnut were, were very common. There's banana ketchup and mushroom ketchup. Basically anything that you're preparing in that sort of vinegar, uh, vinegar and salt sort of preparation style that is done for a ketchup. Um, you can prepare all sorts of different things. Oyster ketchup? Really, Kira? There's oyster ketchup? Oh, um, and Kira has dropped a, a link to one of our blog posts on our uh, food history blog, What's Cooking VT, um, with information about ketchup. Uh, have you seen those YouTubers who go back in time and cook based on the 18th? I have. Um, I don't remember. Uh, I've seen a couple of different ones. I saw one. I don't remember the name of it, um, but it was sort of a living history type uh, program. I just can't remember who it is. Townsend's. Okay. Um, and then there's Tasting History, which I've mentioned before on stream, um, where he goes and does actual like research and gives you a history lesson. Um, also, trying old recipes. He'll take a recipe and um, come up with a way to make it, interpret it as best as possible with the help of food historians, uh, does research, and will show you, um, explain how he made it, show you the finished product, taste it on stream, and give you a history lesson along with it. It's a very nice program. If you haven't seen Tasting History, it's definitely worth a look. Um, uh, the last recipe I saw him do was uh, a recipe from Egyptian hieroglyphs. Um, so best approximation of what that was, because we didn't really know. Um, and working with historians, he came up with a best approximation and made an attempt. Uh, so it's an interesting program. Townsend's is a good one. Uh, and Hannah has mentioned tasting history. 18th century gingerbread. Once you figure out the conversions, it, Kira recommends. Mrs. Crombie. Oh, uh, cooking the Victorian way. Yes, I've seen that one also. Um, all right, so we've looked at this one. Uh, definitely more of that. Uh, this was undated, I thought, but it's definitely still 1800s sort of cursive um, script. Uh, let's see, what else do I have here? I have C. Fictal. It's kind of the same as other stuff that we've looked at, so I'm going to skip that one. Um, 
Hartford recipe book. We have seen this one on stream before when I was doing old recipe books. Um, the old, uh, honestly, it was just last month that I was doing patent medicines and folk remedies, etc. And this book came out, but it's a good handwriting book. So let's find a recipe in here. Um, there's actually a couple different uh, hands that have written in this book. But now we're not just looking for home remedies. We're looking for just, you know, good examples of handwriting. Here I have a recipe for birch wine. Lord Portico starts a coffee to establish an archive test kitchen. <laughs> Uh, Lord Portico, uh, no need to apologize for drifting off into brief readings. And, and as Kira points out, there are several archives that have the test kitchens. I was explaining to them that our dream would be to have one, but that we do not presently have the funding or facilities in which to have a test kitchen of our own. Um, and that we would have to work with the test kitchen on campus if we wanted to hold some sort of event that needed one, and that would be a logistical challenge. Oh, apparently Duke's YouTube channel has some interesting stuff as well. Thank you, Kira. All right, I have a recipe here for birch wine. Um, what is the date on this book, Kira? The Hartford recipe book, 2008-27. Uh, what is the date on this? Uh, sometime between 1800 and 1833. Uh, so the earlier end of those 1800s. The vernal sap of the birch is well known to have a saccharine quality and make a an wholesome diuretic wine. In the beginning of March, while the sap is rising and before the leaves shoot out, bore holes in the bodies of the larger trees and put uh, faucets, yes, put faucets therein made of elder sticks with the pith taken out, setting vessels under to receive the liquor. Uh, if the tree be large, you may tap it in four or five places at a time. And thus from several trees, you may draw several gallons of juice in a day. <clears throat> If you do not get enough in one day, bottle up close what you have, uh, what you have got, uh, till you get sufficient for your purpose. But the sooner it is boiled, the better. Boil the sap as long as any scum rises, skimming it all the time. To every gallon of liquor, put four pounds of sugar and boil it afterwards, half an hour, skimming it well, then put it in an oven, uh, put it in an open tub to cool, and when cold, turn it into the cask. When it has done working, bung it up, to, bung it up close and keep it three months. Then either bottle it off or draw it out of the cask when a year old. <laughs> oh, coffee reminds you you should go back to updating yours. It's been your work in progress this week. Good luck. Um, those kinds of things take some work. So I will hope for you that you are able to update it fairly nicely. We have a recipe here for white paint. Not Duke. But and academic archives, uncertain which one. <clears throat> but there is an academic archives out there with a food history collection that has videos on their YouTube channel. That's as much as we know uh, because apparently it was not Duke and um, Kira's memory is failing as to what actual place it was. Which is totally fine because I know for a fact Kira is probably doing seven things right now. <clears throat> White paint. To buy the white paint, uh, 
This says to buy the white paint. I do not know what this means. Is that like an at sign? Um, something per pound and linseed oil to mix with it and their and spirits of turpentine to dry it. To buy Prussian blue and grind it on. Okay, this literally, like these recipes are, go and buy the paint. <laughs> so for blue paint, uh, to buy, go buy, it's go buy, go buy Prussian blue and grind it on a stone and put a little oil with it, uh, a little white paint put among it to make the color paler, then put linseed oil among it. The oil for paint is such as has been boiled. Spirits of turpentine then put in to dry it. So more of a how to use the paint than how to make the paint because the first instruction is go and buy some paint. First, go buy paint. Then if you want lighter paint, add white paint to it. Then mix it with some linseed oil and then add in some spirits of turpentine so that it will dry. Green. To buy verdigris and ground like the other with a little oil among, to be made paler with a little white paint, thinned with linseed oil. Oh, it's University of Iowa. That does make um, some sense. They do have a rather large uh, food history collection at the University of Iowa. I did not know they had a YouTube channel. Uh, this book um, was from 1800 to 1833. That was the, the date on, on that book's graph. Uh, let's see, I've got a few more here and then I've got some more diaries and some personal papers. Let's see what looks interesting because we've got about 15 minutes left and I want to find something somewhat different than what we've looked at already. <laughs> While I'm looking, you all can look at some of Emily Augusta Elvish's diary. And yes, I did say Elvish. Her last name is Elvish. Although the writing is not Elvish. Except it is because she wrote it and her name is Elvish. <laughs> uh. Cash book. Let's see. Oh. That has some really nice letters. I, we might show that one in just a second here. What about this one? Some more interesting letter forms. There's so much, so much to look at. That's pretty similar to what we've already seen. All right. Uh, I, will, I will attempt to read an entry from Elvish's diary here. Uh, this is from Emily Augusta Elvish. I don't know anything about her. Um, Emily Augusta Shade Elvish. This diary is from, dated 1854 to 1860. 
Unmarried school teacher in Perry, Illinois in the mid-1800s, Elvish writes eloquently of her devotion to God and berates herself for not being a better person or more worthy of God's love. Among the topics Elvish writes about are her sisters, a friend leaving for Persia, and her mother's earlier death. Again, the blessed Sabbath has dawned upon us with uh, rest for body and mind if we will only accept of it. It is the last Sabbath in the month, and what changes may not another week bring on. I fear more from my own sinful nature than anything else. I know that God can only do right, but I feel that I am very sinful. Uh, and that unless an almighty arm comes to my aid, I cannot reach my better home. Good thing we know it's her, no sure it's her and not an Elvish impersonator. Oh dear, SimSilica, thank you for bringing a speak attack to the archives stream. <laughs> um, that one's an interesting one. I, I may have to revisit it at some point in the future. I'm trying to show off as many handwriting styles as possible in the time that we have, and we're definitely running out of time. And here I have English receipt slash home remedy book circa 1830s to 1840s. This is one of those books that I basically just cannot read at all. But look at the letters. They're really pretty. Uh, your favorite recipe in this item is the recipe for an emetic to get a fish bone out of your throat. I think I saw that one before. Um, let me see. For toothache. Little white cakes, baked custards. For colds or feverish complaints. Receipt for a strain or sprain. <clears throat> for uh, spasms in the stomach or chest. For burmy. Crisp biscuits. I don't know where it is. I'm not finding it extremely quickly. But the handwriting in here is it's so small. What is uh, Mrs. Again, proper names defeat me easily. Uh, receipt for elder wine, two quarts of water to one of berries Picked from the stalk, boil them half an hour, strain them off, and to every gallon of liquor, put three pounds of moist sugar and don't know, and something, then boil all together <clears throat> in half an hour, put into a tub, and when almost cold, uh, yeah, anyway, recipe for elder wine, um, but look at the letter forms here, uh, they're very, they all have flourishes, um, they have the slant, uh, which 1800s has that slant, in long form writing, but these have, like, look at the the stem on the D in the word and here. It it comes up and is a full curve. There's there's a lot of flourish to them. It's very pretty and flowy and flourishy writing. Um, and the nib is fine. It's typical of current current shrift, 
but is also in other writings. Thank you, Scraff. That is... See, I like it when people that know what I'm looking at, like know about the things that I look at show up um, because I wouldn't know these things. And when you put them in chat, I can share them and then other people know. <laughs> the way the D has a stroke is current shift. So here I have a cash book and I thought that these letters looked very interesting to see. Um, it's very calligraphic uh, with the way that the, the lines are thin in places and longer in others. Um, I don't know for certain that this was written with a fountain pen, but I would expect possibly so um, because the nib on a fountain pen allows you to vary the width of the line. Uh, whereas like a ballpoint pen doesn't. And honestly, in 1888, I don't even know if ballpoint pens even existed. Uh, I don't know enough about pen history to know that. Um, there weren't fountain pens. Okay, so this would have been like a uh, quill, possibly? Dip pens. Oh, yeah, okay with flexi nibs. Thank you. <laughs> well, I'm glad that you uh, find the channel to be good. Um, I definitely enjoy doing this show once a week. Dip pens with metal nibs. So not, not quills, which was dipping a feather in, but an actual metal nib, but you have to dip it rather than it having uh, a cartridge inside with the ink. Thank you. But yeah, so this is definitely a, a cal calligraphic inspired. This is from 1888. It doesn't have the extreme slant that so much of it had, um, but all the capital letters are really embellished. Um, I just thought that this very, this, it's, it's a very embellished style of writing. And this is an account book. And so this is not even like writing a letter to somebody. This is keeping accounts. This is cash paid out. <laughs> Cartridges are a modern way of filling a fountain pen. Uh, and they were invented in the 50s. Also, the first ballpoint was invented in 1888. It was called the fountain marker. Invented to write on fabrics, but wasn't for writing. Awesome. In the 1930s, it became a hit. And people started using ballpoint pens. <laughs> that, is, um, that is really fascinating. I, I kind of like investigating pens. Um, <coughs> pardon me, sorry, dry. Um, my grandmother had a ton of pens. Um, and I, they were all really interesting. I don't know if she collected them or what, but I just know she had a, a large variety of them and I found them rather interesting. I don't tend to use fountain pens myself because I get ink all over my hands. Um, let's see, Isaac White letters. When are these from? More 1800s. Everything's from the 1800s. I was hoping that I had something here from a different time period, but honestly, most of our letters are Civil War letters, so it's not surprising. Um, oh, these letters are, let's see. I have 1940. Mary Stinton Laith to J.J. Lanks. Easter, 1940. Uh, and somehow this is very hard for me to read. Dear Mr. Lanks, 
Starabosa? Mrs. Frack Dalton, 636 Redgate Circle, Norfolk. Mrs. Something Art League is So this has a, a very common sort of writing where in the cursive, the, the line, you know, if you were ever taught to ha do handwriting and do write cursive, um, there's all these that don't forget to cross your T. After you finish writing the word, you have to go back and cross your T's and dot your I's and slash your X's. Um, the T's, the cross of the T is actually like a tail that in most cases, doesn't, doesn't even intersect the letter T at all. Um, oh, president of our art league is, yeah, yeah, fluid N. It is president of our art league. But also just wow, this is really hard to make out what it says. These are very circular, flowy letters, very different from the 1800s stuff that we've been looking at. This is 1940. <clears throat> and we've lost the slant. The, the letter forms in this letter are much more circular, flowy, smooth uh, curves. Uh, but also, are somewhat more difficult to read, at least for me. <laughs> Isn't sure she should, yes, oh, there's no transcript for this letter though. The, the transcripts in this collection are in the folders with the letters, and this one doesn't have one, unless it's in a separate folder. because they have typed transcripts in here, but this folder doesn't have one. <laughs> it's, it's fine. Um, we, are, we are at the end of stream anyway, so I just wanted to show something that wasn't from the 1830s and 1840s. And um, I, we, we have a lot of lovely letters to look at, but um, let me go ahead and uh, figure out what we're going to end today with. Um, okay. <laughs> well, so we are at the end of stream time, so I am going to go ahead and um, close out this stream. Thank you, everybody, for coming. I, I hope that you enjoyed my exploration of some handwritten documents um, and me attempting to try and read some of them. And thank you all so, so very, very much for coming and um, exploring these letters with me. Thank you, especially uh, uh, Fluidan and, and Scraff for <clears throat> helping me with reading German uh, handwritten letters, and Scraff for all of the interesting information that you had about um, kind of the different formations of, of writing that we've been looking at. Um, so next week, the plan is uh, to show off a collection that I definitely know the name of and will tell you in just a second. I'm not secretly looking it up right now, am I? Uh, <laughs> uh, next week and the week after, I plan to show off the Marjorie Rhodes Townsend papers. Um, they are dated 1961 to 1994. Uh, Marjorie Rhodes Townsend, uh, was the first woman to earn an engineering degree at George Washington University with her uh, bachelor's degree in electrical engineering in 1951. She worked at NASA um, and the Naval Research Laboratory and we have her papers here. And so um, they are quite interesting and I plan to show off her papers next week and the week after. Um, 
And then after we take a look at her stuff, we will be in October, and I'm going to see what I can find in our collections that might fit uh, sort of the Halloween spirit, looking for spooky things to show off. Uh, one of the weeks in October, I will definitely showcase our collections that have human hair in them, uh, of which I believe we have 17 uh, collections with actual human hair. Um, so those will be coming up in October. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we are going to be raiding over to Monterey Bay Aquarium uh, as we typically do on Wednesdays. Uh, right now it looks like it's just one of their bay cams, so it is a lovely um, background noise of the water on the bay uh, that you'll be able to see there. Thank you everybody for coming. Thank you Eric for the raid. Um, and hopefully I see you back again uh, next week or in the future for more archival adventures. Um, Scraff, thank you so much for joining on the VTUL Studios channel. Um, I'm also going to set that one up with a raid over to Monterey Bay Aquarium. Uh, so yes, thank you all so much. Uh, I will be live with more from the archives next Wednesday at 2.30 p.m. Uh, Eastern Time right here on twitch.tv slash VTUL Studios and twitch.tv slash Rogan27. So I will uh, catch you all next time. <laughs>